All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about centripetal force with respect to Newton's laws of motion. So in chapter four, we learned about circular motion and the fact that when an object moves in a circle, it can have what we call centripetal acceleration. If you remember, the expression for centripetal acceleration, which is sometimes also referred to radial acceleration, is v squared over r, where r is the radius of a path. v, of course, is how fast it's going. The reason that the object has the centripetal acceleration is because of the change in direction. Because as it goes in a circle, it has to, it can't go straight, so it has to change direction. In any case, we have some problems that we want to look at when we're using Newton's laws, where the object is moving in a circle, and we can be even more specific and make it a little simpler by saying, what if it's moving in what we call uniform circular motion? Uniform circular motion basically means that the object is moving at a constant speed in the circle. This really um, eliminates the need to talk about tangential acceleration, which would be caused by an increase or decrease in speed as the object moved in the circle. So for this situation right now, we're just going to think about uniform circular motion because it's a little simpler. And the idea being that, again, we're moving in a circle, but at a constant speed. Now, as that object is moving in the circle, as we see here, we can see there's a couple different vectors that are shown. Of course, the velocity vector is tangent to the path, which is designated by the dotted line, which is a circle. But then we say, okay, well now there's an acceleration, we're calling that the centripetal acceleration. Remember that it's always directed towards the center of the circle. And so you can see that it's shown in different places on this, on this picture. The uh, acceleration vector is pointing in towards the center of the circle. So when we're looking at the sum of the forces equals the mass times the acceleration, we can think about um, forces that are radial. And when I say radial, what I mean is, here, let's use a pen that works. What I mean is along the radius of the circle, like either in towards the center of the circle or out towards away from the center of the circle. And so just like we might break down forces into x and y components, we could also break them down into radial and also tangential. But like I said, we're going to keep it simple, so we're not going to talk about tangential forces or acceleration in this case. So if we're talking about radial force, so we're going to, again, stick with this idea of components. We'll say that the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the radial acceleration, which is the mass times v squared over r. Oops, it fell onto, the, it went onto the picture, sorry about that. And so I'll just do it here. And so this is how, v squared over r is how we're expressing the acceleration, but we can use, still use Newton's second law and set the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. But when we have this uniform circular motion, the acceleration we expressed is v squared over r. Let's talk about what those forces might be. So when we're using this formulation, of course, we have to put in forces over here. You know, so what, what could be the forces that would cause this type of um, motion? And so there's always going to be a tendency to say, well, it's just a centripetal force, clearly. Well, it's not really actually the correct answer. Yes, I know that the acceleration is centripetal acceleration, so there is a tendency to want to say that the force is a centripetal force, but that's not quite correct. What we should say is there's forces that act as centripetal forces. We're not going to deviate from our definition of what a force is. And so the answer to what's the force that's causing it is really going to have to be the types of forces that we've worked with already. So we 
You know, remember the types of forces were a push or a pull, um, tension, force of a spring, those kinds of things. And so we have to be able to define the force in that way. One example might be, you know, um, maybe I have a ball that's on a string and that's gonna go in a circular path. And we'd say, okay, as it goes in the circular path, what is the force that causes it or keeps it in the center? And we know that that force has to be directed in this direction. We'd have to say, okay, well, what force pulls on the ball in that direction? And we would say, hey, there's a string attached, and so it would be the tension in the string. And so instead of saying a centripetal force belongs here, we might just say tension. Um, although, to be really correct, we'd have to also think about the fact that there's weight as well, and then we would have to break that down into components, and so this would be the angle theta, the same as this is the angle theta, and so, um, so the tension could be one of the forces, but to be absolutely consistent, I'd have to do tension minus mg cosine of theta equals mv squared over r. Now the reason that I wanted to include the weight is because if you really started thinking about it, you might say, oh, well doesn't that ball also have some weight? And that's going to act on the ball as well. And as I draw the forces acting on it, I would have to include that. And that's absolutely right. And it's actually good to you know, expand that and include all the forces as we do, should do to do this properly. But now you see that actually the centripetal forces acting on that ball as it moves in a circle are actually a combination of two different forces. That is, it's a combination of the tension force and also a combination of a component of the weight that acts in the radial direction. I think the biggest thing that we wanna sort of get out of this, sort of talking about this problem, is again, when we want to put in the forces on the left-hand side of Newton's second law, we have to think about real forces that we've dealt with before. We cannot just say, oh, it's a centripetal force. What it will be is a force that is acting as a centripetal force, and so it has to be something real. Here we see an example, tension, weight, those are real forces. Now, the last thing that I wanna talk about because it comes up a lot when we talk about circular motion is this idea of centrifugal forces. And guess what? Not real. And it gets a little bit more involved, but I think that we can understand how this works. So, Think about examples where you might have, in the past, said that there was a centrifugal force acting on you. For example, if you're on an amusement park ride that goes in a circle, you often feel like you're being pushed out against the outside of that circle. Same thing could happen if you're in the car and you go around a turn very quickly, you might feel pushed out against the car door as well. And so, our our tendency is to sort of say, oh, it's a centrifugal force is what's causing this. Well, once again, just as there's no such thing, you can't really say just centripetal force and leave it at that. This is similar, but a little bit different because actually there's no such thing as a centrifugal force. Um, if you really think about it, if you wanted it to be a real force, you would have to say, what, what's pushing against me? You know, like, it's not magic. It's not like a ghost that's pushing against you. And so to really treat it as a real force, we would have to be able to explain what was causing the force outward. It turns out though, that it's not really a force, but it's a, a effect of your inertia. Because when you're going in a circle, like right here, your velocity vector, of course, is tangent to that circle. But what's happening is the physical scenario that you're experiencing, whether it be you're on an amusement park ride that makes you go in a circle, or you're in a car and the car is turning, you are actually being forced to change your direction. Your inertia, if you had your velocity vector was just like here, at this instant in time, 
your inertia wants you to keep on going in that straight direction. That was Newton's first law. But something keeps you from doing that. In a sense, if you're in the car, you're moving forward, and the car turns in front of you, and so your inertia pushes you forward, but then you sort of encounter the door, and so you feel like you're being pushed against the door. A similar thing would happen on the, the amusement park ride, where you would want to go in that tangential path and keep on moving, but then the ride sort of keeps you, it, it blocks you, literally, so you actually, your inertia, your motion, runs you into the ride as it keeps going in its circular path. And so your, your instinct or your reaction is to say, I got pushed against it, but in a sense, it was your inertia that brought you into either the car door or the ride. The most important thing is to say, is to never say, there's a centrifugal force. And so in this picture down here, they're trying to show that you might want to say that there's a force downward because that would be out away from the center of the circle, which we, in, we instinctively think of the direction of a centrifugal force. But that's not actually the correct um, way. To, you wouldn't want to draw a force in that direction because it doesn't actually exist. And so we would never want to do that. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So this is it to talk about centripetal forces and acceleration and how we work with Newton's second law.